status booster. Go. GNC. Go. Usually, nations go tend to go on. first yeah. to the moon, fly by the moon, and then orbit the moon, and then land on the moon and then fly by Mars, and then orbit Mars. The United Arab Emirates decided to skip all that and go straight to Mars. Nothing about this mission is easy. 50% of the missions that were sent to Mars failed. Every successful business starts with a great idea. Today, moving from concept to reality is easier than ever before. Join us as we travel around the world and meet developers, architects, and innovators to learn how they're building on the AWS cloud. Welcome to This Is My Architecture. Our journey starts over 7,000 miles away from Dubai, here in Boulder, Colorado, where the Emirates Mars Mission's Hope Probe was built. Getting to Mars is incredibly hard and requires a specially designed launch vehicle and spacecraft. The vehicle has to withstand traveling a vast distance in the harsh environment of space, and then make a precision burn to land in the orbit around the red planet. After 11 long minutes of radio silence, cheers erupt in the command center on the confirmation of a successful orbiting insertion. The UAE has made it to Mars. So Pete, you're the Emirates Mars Mission Project Manager. What does that involve? So as the Project Manager, I'm responsible to make sure that the program meets all its ob objectives uh, on a schedule and in budget. And what were some of those high-level objectives? So the, the overall objective was to further understand the, the atmospheric uh, processes uh, on, on Mars and how those evolve globally over seasons and over time. In order to do that, we had to create three instruments to look at the planet in three different colors of light or wavelengths, and then send that data back, back to Earth um, for, for analysis. A team from the Emirates worked directly with the University of Colorado to build the spacecraft, drawing on the expertise from the university's laboratory for atmospheric and space physics. WASP is part of a knowledge partnership with the Emiratis, and they came to us saying, look, we want to uh, understand what it means to go into an interplanetary mission and to learn about space from an engineering level and a scientific level. So they said, as a partner, can you teach us this and can we work side by side with you? We don't want to buy this expertise. We want to learn it and take it into our, our future. So I understand one of the key instruments, the EXI, was built here. Tell me, what does it do? So that's the Emirates Exploration Imager. And so it's taking pictures of the planet and it's doing so in six uh, wavelength bands. There's a red, green, blue, and then there are three ultraviolet wavelength bands. This actually gets accomplished because there's a filter wheel that has um, a filter for each of those bands. So the filter is moving in place while we're taking images of the planet. Something that's different about the orbit of this mission is that we're at a high enough altitude that we can take an image of Mars all in one field of view. And so over the course of the week, we can look at what is happening in the atmosphere. And of course, over the course of a year, seasonally, we can see how that changes. So this is an engineering model of EXI, and it's an exact duplicate of what's in flight around Mars right now. You can notice, first off, that there are two different shapes out front. Those are the two different lens systems. We have a, a visible camera and a UV camera. So the UV camera just cares about the Mars surface, and so that's round because Mars is round. And then with the visible camera, we're hoping to catch a moon, a star, some other things in some of our pictures with Mars. A decision we made very early on was to ensure that we didn't need to develop new technologies. We actually used existing technologies in clever ways. The innovation of the program lies in how we managed it, how we developed it, how we formed the partnership and the collaboration. The hardware and software itself, it's mostly heritage. The entire project was just six years in the making and cost under $200 million, a fraction of previous projects. But I still want to understand why the UAE is making such an investment in space. I spoke with Omran Sharaf, the Emirates Mars Mission's project director, to learn more. The UAE government wanted to see a disruptive change in our ecosystem when it came to science and technology. For us, it's about the future of our economy. The leadership here in the UAE believes that the future of our economy will depend on science and technology, will depend on uh, innovation creativity. 
And to do that, we need to have a strong and an advanced science technology. So the UAE looked at Mars as a mean or a tool for that bigger objective. Uh, and also to send a very strong message to the Arab youth is that if a young nation like the UAE is able to reach Mars in less than 50 years, then it can do much more. Omran, an inspiration to so many nations and to our youth. Thanks so much. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. The Hope Probe will spend one Martian year. That's about two Earth years gathering data from the red planet's atmosphere, all of which will be ingested by the cloud. But how are they going to do that from so far away? Well, I've come to Dubai to find out. So, Mohammed, I see the Hope Probe here. Tell me about some of the data that it collects. OK. Basically, we have uh, three onboard instruments on the spacecraft. The first one is EXI, which is the Emirates uh, Exploration Imager, which takes the images of planet Mars. Uh, we have EMUS, which is the Emirates Mars uh, Ultraviolet Spectrometer, which gives us ultraviolet uh, data from the atmosphere. And we have EMERS, which is the Emirates Mars Infrared Spectrometer. Those instruments on board the spacecraft are used to study the upper and lower atmosphere of Mars. So it's a mixture of textual files as well as rich image files? Yes. So how does that data get down to Earth? The data gets transmitted through the Deep Space Network, which is uh, managed all around the world by NASA. And then we have the Mission Operations Center here at MBRC, which receives the data. It gets initially processed, and then it gets pushed to an S3 bucket we have, which is called the landing bucket. What size is some of that data? Uh, it could vary between a few megabytes of data and it could be very small files. And how frequently is the data coming? We have two contacts per week that is done by the MOC and each contact has a window of 16 hours. It's a very small window. Yeah. A lot of data gets generated out there in space and needs to travel back down to Earth. How does that happen? It's very challenging, and it's mostly challenging because of the vast distances that we're talking about. So if you look at the fact that we have data that's stored in the spacecraft and it needs to be sent to Earth, it is millions of kilometers away. So what we actually do is we send radio frequency through a high gain antenna, but that antenna concentrates the energy into a beam that has to be precisely located on this planet. When that energy hits the Earth, well, now something has to pick it up. And so we use NASA's deep space network. That information is collected through those antenna and then sent to a central site, which in EMM's case is the Mission Operations Center at MBRC. So the data sitting there in S3, what happens next? Uh, so the first uh, lambda, it gets triggered by this uh, an S3 event once we receive the data. So this lambda, what it basically does, it checks what type of data we are receiving and whether we are receiving correct or incorrect data. If the data is correct, uh, it will move the data into another bucket, uh, which we store all of our science and ancillary data that we receive from the Mission Operations Center. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as it will uh, index those data into an RDS uh, database we have, which is the SDC database. Mm -hmm. Another thing that it does uh, after this Lambda runs, uh, it sends an SNS notification that tells us whether this process was uh, done successfully or we have any errors that occur during this process, in which this SNS is, uh, gets sent to uh, the development team. We have. To know that it's actually arrived. Yeah, to know that the data arrived. Right. Why are you using different S3 buckets? So the first S3 bucket we're using is the bucket that we first received the data from the mock into this bucket. Uh, this bucket, uh, the science data bucket, we're using it to actually store the data right. that we have. So the science data, which are the data from the instrument, as well as the ancillary files. So different processes need different permissions. Yes. Right. OK, so what happens after You've got two different layers of storage here. What happens next? We have an S3 event that is also configured to trigger another Lambda. This Lambda also uh, sends an uh, SNS notification, which tells us whether uh, a new file has been received, for instance, in this science data bucket. Yeah. So quite clever. You're actually using the S3 event trigger 
capability yeah, to actually capability. chain all these different yeah. lambdas together. So we've got indexes sitting over here in RDS. What about this S3 bucket? Uh, this S3 bucket, we have a lambda that sends the data that uh, we have received from each instrument and it sends like a file that will be used as an input to the next component, which is the processing component. Great. And we're going to get into this a little bit yeah. later. Fantastic. Mohammed, thanks for sharing your architecture with me. Thank you very much. So currently we are in the science phase of the mission. I started the science phase in, in May of uh, this year. Uh, and we've been collecting data and calibrating the data and preparing it for the release that's going to take place basically uh, on the 1st of October 2021. And we're looking forward to share this data with the rest of the world and hopefully um, have the scientists around the world use this data to benefit from it and come up with new findings. It's apparent that all that data being transmitted from the HOPE probe is priceless. But how does the team at the Space Centre process all that data? I spoke with Omran Hartmed Al Hamadi to learn more. So Omran, we learned how you collect data from the probe and store it, but I know you have some instrument developers that are keen to get their hands on it. How do they do that? We have, uh, for each instrument on board uh, the spacecraft, a team that is responsible for developing uh, processing software that will generate high level of scientific products. So they develop the software, they create a Docker image uh, for the software, and then they access, uh, securely access the EC2 instance through the SSH protocol in order to push their Docker image to the ECR service. Right, so each team has their own EC2 instance to do that. And then using ECR, I imagine they can keep different versions of that software. So we learned before about the science products that get stored. Tell us a little bit about what those science products are. Once we receive level zero scientific products, which are the binary files, plus the SPICE files that is required by the processing software to generate high level of scientific products. And these SPICE files are, contains information about uh, the geometry of the spacecraft, the location, exact location of the spacecraft with respect to the Mars or with, the, with respect to the Sun, plus other information that is required by the processing software. All right, so you've got these science products sitting in S3 that we learned about before. How does it all kick off? So once we have the level zero products, the SPICE files available, uh, that will trigger lambda function. And the idea behind this lambda function is to kick off the step function, which orchestrate the workflow of the data processing so uh, software. So once the step function kick off, uh, the jo bad job will grab the appropriate Docker image from ECR service and then kick off level one processing software, which will generate uncalibrated scientific products. Right. And then once we have these uncalibrated data, the level two processing software will be kicked off to generate calibrated information. Once we generate this information, the output level two and level one products will be stored back to S3. Right, so I see you're continuing on the theme of event-driven architecture, but tell me why you chose Batch. Batch is a great service for asynchronous job running. So we have a bad job that is running for each instrument uh, independently. We don't have to wait for a specific instrument data to be complete in order to kick off the processing for the data for other instruments. And of course, Batch automatically provisions all the compute uh, and you know, memory that you need for the actual job. So that's more heavy lifting taken away. So I see you've got some more storage service. Tell us about how you're using Dynamo RDS and I see EFS there as well. Yes, we mount an EFS service and storage to bad job so that the instrument uh, team and their processing software can save logs into that storage service. They can store intermediate data onto that storage service or they can have access to the SPICE files that we send from the S3 to uh, EFS. So that's why we use EFS. For the RDS, we provide the instrument team facility and their processing software access to a separate database, a separate, a separate RDS instance for them. Once we complete uh, the processing jobs, uh, the Lambda function will collect the status of processing jobs, what time they run, how long they take, uh, the status of them, and store that into DynamoDB. So this is the entire pipeline that we uh, architect for the instrument team facility to run their processing software to generate high level of scientific products and store them into S3 that will be accessible later on for the, from the science community. 
So the significance of the EMM data that is being returned is that it's completely unique. Never before have we had uh, data of this type. The previous Mars missions have only been able to take a snapshot of what's happening in the Mars atmosphere because of their orbit. Our orbit gives us an opportunity to view Mars atmosphere daily, weekly, monthly, and over seasons to really be able to see how the atmosphere is evolving and uh, changing over time. But one of the most important questions that this data will hope to aid the community to better understand is essentially what happened to the Martian atmosphere. One of the driving questions of Mars science is what happened to the water on Mars? And one of the hypotheses is that it has been lost to space through atmospheric interactions and atmospheric loss. Eventually, we will be, have a better understanding of how Mars lost its water, um, at what point it may have been habitable, which has implications for life on that planet outside of our own planet. I think that's a very exciting topic uh, in planetary science right now. One big aspect of this mission and why it was called HOPE, it's again to inspire Emiratis and Arab youth, but also it's to promote science diplomacy. So it's one of, one of the things that the UAE wanted at the end of the day, us understanding Mars, will help us as humans better, to better understand our own planet uh, and the changes happening around us. So sharing it with the scientists around the world, with no restrictions, definitely will benefit humanity. So Omran, I've spoken to the science community about how they use the data, but let's dive into how you make it available to them. To do that, we developed a website that will be accessible by the science community to, to, re to retrieve data from the uh, the platform that we have. We configured an S3 bucket to act as a web host. Since we have the science scientists across the globe, we utilize CloudFront to cache the, the content of the website closer to the scientists. And we have created a registration form for the scientists to go and access the, the data uh, that will be managed by Cognito to manage the user accounts uh, of the registered uh, scientist. Great, so that takes care of your static files. What about all the dynamic data that you generate for them? We developed secure API gateway that's secured by Cognito so that only a registered user can access that API. This API can be requested and interfaced with the static content. So once the request hits the API gateway, it will trigger a Lambda function that will handle the request, see what is the nature of the request. Is it a query request? Is it a file download request? And if it's a query request, it will query the SDC database that we have or indexes of the files stored there and then send back the result to the scientist. If the request is download request, the Lambda function will retrieve the files from the S3 bucket and zip the files, send the files back to the scientist. When it comes to space exploration, usually nations look at it as a space race. The UAE never looked at it as a space race. It looked at it as an opportunity for collaboration, an opportunity to work together with other nations. When the United Arab Emirates reached Mars, they became just the fifth country in the world to reach that amazing feat. And they did it with an unprecedented low budget and short time frame. It's a true testament to what a country can do with a strong vision, an investment in STEM for its people, and embracing the spirit of global collaboration. The UAE has proven that the democratization of space is possible, and they're just getting started. Dubai's ruler, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, has got big aspirations. It's an exciting frontier for space applications, and to boldly go where no one has gone before with the cloud.